My name's Julie Beveridge, and it's my absolute pleasure to be here with you today when I'll be speaking with some of the shortlisted uh, projects from the category of the Carl Langer Award for Urban Design. Today we'll be hearing from uh, Phil Jackson from Goma Bailey Architects, Jürgen Weigel from Archifield, Amy Degenhart from Degenhart Shared Architecture and Urban Design, and Jesse Judd from Arm and Archipelago. If you have any questions for the presenters during their presentations, please use the Q&A or chat function of Zoom and we'll go through them uh, at the end of uh, everybody's presentation or if there's time at the end of each individual presentation. First up, we have Phil Jackson, who is director at Gaima Bailey Architects, who will be walking us through uh, their shortlisted project, California Lane. Uh, over to you, Phil. Great. Okay, so California Lane, um, for those of you um, who don't know, is in the Fortitude Valley um, in the Lachlan and Brunswick streets. So um, it's, it was a, a great project that uh, for us went for about five years through the design period. And um, it was with a, a client of ours um, that we've worked with for a number of years um, who actually lived, I, I hope everyone can see my cursor, but he actually grew up in McLaughlin Street, um, just in this house down in the top uh, right hand side there, um, Arthur Apostolos uh, with his um, brothers and sisters and parents. Um, so this, the story started for the, for the Apostolos family in around the 1950s, uh, when their dad, when he was in his 20s, bought the um, California Cafe, and those of you who are my vintage or um, perhaps a little bit older can remember the, the trucker's breakfast at the California Cafe it was a, a real institution of that part of the valley. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot of history uh, for them growing up um, on McLaughlin Street. And um, in the context of, of urban design, it was a really interesting project because um, a couple of years beforehand, um, Arthur and Charlie and his two sisters um, they developed Bakery Lane, Bakery Lane, just over in the center of the image there. And then previous to that, it also developed up Wind Lane. Um, and so it was really part of um, Arthur's passion and the whole family's passion for the valley, that they um, were really keen to start these, the laneways um, to get them as vibrant as possible and um, interconnecting. So, and actually go down through California Lane, down Lucky's Lane, into Bakery Lane, and then walk down into Wind Lane. So it was establishing this network that you can experience as part of the Laneways uh, Festival. So um, I think one of the most enjoyable parts of um, architecture is getting to know your clients even better and hearing all the stories of um, you know, growing up, uh, in particular this part of the valley. Um, it's vibrance and um, you know, playing in the streets that you couldn't imagine right now um, and going to school locally. So it's really quite a, um, a vibrant community through there. So um, really the, the laneway itself, you can see down through here is adjacent and Energex um, easement through here. And you can see that connectivity going down through Lucky's Lane and then into Bakery and then into wind through there. So it's really a self-contained um, area. So this image was um, pre-development. So you could see um, um, Arthur and his family own pretty much that slice of um, building stock down through there. And so it was very much a back of house over two split levels um, through the laneway. So one of the challenges was obviously to connect through there and on grade um, with access and all the other things. But the real opportunity was to get um, permeability off Brunswick Street through all of these tenancies down into the laneway for outdoor eating areas. Um, so the, uh, the other part of it is that for, um, 
for Arthur and, and Charlie and the family, they had um, really an interest in creating small shop tenancies. So the majority of these tenancies are between 12 and 24 square meters in the laneway. So they're really um, designed for uh, small startups, uh, jewelry makers, small internet companies, groups of two to, to four to five. And um, so there's a real mix of tenancy and it's really interesting um, just seeing how Arthur and the family work with their tenants and develop a real rapport with them and develop like-minded people as part of developing a real laneway community um, down through here with all the shop owners. So that's really part of him imparting his passion for the valley through you know, getting like-minded people all, um, all working together through there. So it all started uh, with Arthur's dad down through there in the uh, California cafe on the corner in the shop. There's a real rich history down through there and all the fixtures are actually still kept in storage um, from the cafe. So it's a real part of the heritage of the valley. So you can see through here the existing site um, uh, was, <laughs> wasn't much to, to look at in some ways but really rich in others when you can see the um, the brickwork and the, the lintels and all of the other um, aspects of it and the layers of history down through there. So part of it was really just stripping back all of that facade uh, and taking away all of these interventions that were just added to and added to over the over time. Multi, multi layers running through. So you can see there the, um, the change in level as you come down um, through that existing site. And the opportunity too for longer views as you, as you come through the space. And this is the, uh, the view from McLaughlin Street um, running down through there. So that was actually the veranda of the cafe at that point. So this is the actual um, laneway in its completed form. Um, a lot of it was about activating the, uh, the streetscape in the corner uh, and also bringing in the colours of the and tones of that Californian feeling down through there. Um, and a lot of it was also around creating spaces that are very small scale but flexible that could be um, gutted out to change size uh, at various times running down through there. You can see there just the way it's designed to tie into the streetscape of McLaughlin Street. And this is back to the existing condition down through there with Giardinetto's restaurant had an outdoor dining space down through there. So part of that challenge, as you can see, as we strip back the facades down through there, there was even a lot of layering down through these that, you know, from fires that have been through the building before started to get uncovered. Um, in various ways, a lot of services along the back edge. And uh, it was really um, interesting stripping all that back, but then using a language um, to expose services on the facade. And then in some places, things remained, some places um, they were stripped right back to the, to the brickwork. So as you go through so pretty much the design was split into two halves where the back of these tenancies to develop just outdoor dining spaces to get that northern light running through. And on the, and on the fa south facing side were majority of the tenancies. And these were designed down the track for Arthur to be able to infill these um, at a later date should, should that be, um, be desired. So there's a lot of discussions around and Arthur did a um, bit of travel um, looking at laneways and proportions and what was successful. Um, so we were recently deliberate about how we um, created the, the scale of the laneway as it runs through. And then framing the view of the stair as well, changing scale. And, um, and having these little opportunities for um, people to uh, just to the right, there's a performance space. There's another space at the top of at the end of the laneway for performance as well. And um, for it to be populated during the laneway markets and, and other things. And about getting that vibrancy um, running through there and uh, the interaction with the landscape as well. 
so these these small incubator um, shop owners and and craftsmen and there's really um, a, a rich space for creativity. And that's about it. Over to you, Julie. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, I love those pictures at the end that have everybody enjoying the the markets and eateries as they should be, which sadly we can't necessarily at the moment. Um, if you would like to uh, turn your uh, screen sharing off now, I'll be able to hand over to our second speaker, who is uh, Jürgen Weigel from Archifield. Um, and Jürgen will be presenting the shortlisted entry Elizabeth Arcade. And uh, before I hand over to him, I should note that this project was also awarded the Lord Mayor's Buildings That Breathe Award. So congratulations to Jürgen and his team on that achievement. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Julian. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to present Elizabeth Arcade at this webinar. So to early 2015, student one approached Arcfield and asked us to redesign and redefine Elizabeth's Arcade. So Elizabeth's Arcade is right in the heart of the city, so you see it here, and faces Elizabeth Street as well as Charles Street, and it's, right, it's located right behind the Maya Center. It is a very narrow side. It is just 20 meters wide and 90 meters long. So there are clearly challenges in that. And on top of that, there's also a level difference of 3.5 meters between Elizabeth Street and uh, Charlotte Street. So Elizabeth Arcade is a well-known place in the city of Brisbane. So they are very excited about the rare opportunity to change and improve an important part of the inner city fabric. Um, as you can see, it is a, a mid-block site um, between Elizabeth Street and uh, Charlotte Street. And um, the images here to the right and the left, they basically show the original arcade. There was a very sad and dark arcade and uh, it was quite narrow, it was actually low, had no extra height in there. The, the interface to the retail tenancies wasn't great. And um, overall, the arcade was on a slope to um, deal with the level difference between Elizabeth Street and Charlotte Street. And that made it really difficult actually to have seating in there or any, any sort of um, places amenity. This is a very early um, concept design diagram, and uh, but it represents the brief, the client brief, quite well. Two towers over a podium, and um, the tower has to accommodate 900 beds for student accommodation, and um, the podium has has to accommodate 1,000 square meter of retail space within an arcade, and 1,000 square meter student common areas on level one. So it became clear to us and the client that the success of the arcade was key to the overall success of the building. So we looked at traditional arcades and we wanted to learn what actually works well in this arcade and what doesn't. So this uh, examples we looked at, they had a lot of light in there. Many of them had glazed roofs. They're possible they allowed views to the sky and uh, a very common thing is also a datum line, which they all have above um, the retail shop front. And that's a combining element, which seems to be important. And also clear sidelines to the entries and the exits is also important. And then there's this thing about the width, they're not very wide spaces. 
and um, they, they also not really narrow. There seems to be sort of a sweet spot in between. And then the interface of the retail shop fronts with the actual arcades is really important too. So that's the laneways, but uh, oh, sorry, that's the arcades, but then we had the idea about laneways as well. So the, the block between Elizabeth Street and Charlotte Street traditionally had uh, several laneways there, which currently um, not activated. And uh, it was councils in council's interest to reactivate these laneways and uh, we try to contribute our part to it. But um, also we really liked, um, when we looked more into it, we really liked the um, charm and um, the casual appearance of, of laneways. So we looked at a couple of examples in Melbourne and overseas and uh, this really inspired our design as well. So it all led to um, quite simple design principles. We made the decision to have a more formal arcade on the Elizabeth Street side and a uh, casual laneway type arcade on the Charlotte Street side. And in the center, we introduced a social heart as a public space. So public space was an important part to us. And um, we, we also introduced therefore smaller public spaces just at the entry to the arcade. And the public areas, they are marked with trees. So there's an existing tree on a street tree on Charlotte Street, for sure we left that one there, and then introduced two new ones, one in the social heart and one um, at Elizabeth Street. The white areas here represent um, the retail space, but then early on the decision was made that um, there shouldn't be retail, it all will be restaurants, it's a full hospitality um, arcade. Overall, it basically led to a sequence of uh, different spaces, or if you will, the arcade journey. It starts with, starts with the Elizabeth Street entry area. As I said, it's a public space, the seating opportunities, people can meet there. And from here, you go into the Elizabeth Street arcade, the double height formal arcade, the social heart, the Charlotte Street laneway, and then the Charlotte Street entry area. The arcade entries, really important. They mark the entries to the arcade, so it should be really visible from the street space. There it is. It also gives something back to the public, the seating areas and meeting areas. And um, so we're very proud of the trees we, we managed to get into there. Uh, we pushed the podium facade further in just to allow for the space uh, for the trees and to give some relief to, to the street space anyway. A really important part of this design is also the podium facade. The podium facade picks up the height of the adjacent building and uh, also provides uh, privacy for, and, and sun shading for the building users. And um, the color scheme is a reference to the heritage listed uh, buildings in the neighborhood, old brick buildings. The former Elizabeth Street Arcade is a double height space. The walls are tiled, mainly white tiles with a brick base. And uh, the blue tiled areas at the top are planters. The planters create a datum line which follows um, all the way through the arcade from the front to the back. And um, the brick base is also a reference to the buildings which were originally on site, which were all brick buildings and got demolished. The social heart is a truly public space. It provides seating areas, the tree I was talking about. There's a big column right in the center of it, which grounds one of the towers. And the brick wall behind is also a reference to, to past buildings. Uh, the smaller images on the right hand side, I mean, the first one shows daytime use. It's mainly for people either to slow down and rest for a while in this public space, or people just use the arcade uh, as a shortcut between Elizabeth Street, Street and Charlotte Street, or go to one of the restaurants. But 
at night time, this space is uh, regularly used as an event space as well. The small images from the opening where it comfortably accommodated several hundred people. The ravine, so we call the space between the two towers the ravine. It's a dramatic space with the two towers quite close to each other. And uh, we put quite a bit of focus on it by putting, by using um, pink and red colors. But it also creates a moment of surprise. So if you walk through the social heart and you look up, you see this um, quite nice and dramatic space. You see the sky and, um, and you have a lot of light in this space. So the laneway or the laneway part of the arcade is, has darker finishes. It's more brick and uh, blue stained concrete. It has a planter and a seating edge to one side and uh, restaurants and food outlets to the other side. And again, there's a lot of salvage brick. There's this um, core um, drilled um, brick wall part, which we then reused as tools here. The stair from the social heart up to student to student one lobby is also a really important part as student one is the main user of the building. And the stair was also located at the social heart. Also the tower itself or the towers, how they were located in the city was quite important. They had to fit into the existing fabric and the podium, the podium um, facade provides a transition between the street space and the towers. On uh, generally arcades have problems um, um, activating the level one area, especially when they have um, double height spaces. So we had the unique opportunity here to accommodate the student uh, communal spaces on level one, which would provide activation almost all day and basically all week. And um, so this day I mentioned you come up to the student accommodation lobby and uh, from here you have uh, different areas, uh, gaming areas, there are, there are multi-purpose rooms, meeting rooms and so on. So if you look up from um, the, the arcade, you would always see activity there and the other way around, it gives students students always the feeling that they actually ride in the center of the city, they're part of an important part of the city. And at the end, the roof deck was quite important as well. It uh, provides a barbecue area for the students, a seat, seating lounge and, um, and an outdoor cinema. But I personally find it amazing being there at nighttime, seeing all these buildings around it it really gives you the feeling that you're right in the center of the city. It's an amazing uh, roof terrace. And then right at the end, the facade screens, they're actually important. I mean, I mentioned the podium screen, that is an important building part, but also the tower screens, they um, helped us to provide privacy to the building users, also dress up the building, and uh, they were really important for the sun shading on the building. That's pretty much me. Um, back to you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Jürgen. Such an interesting journey in colour as well as uh, space. Uh, the next project that we're going to hear about today uh, has also been shortlisted for Regional Project of the Year. Um, and so congratulations to Amy and her team on, on that shortlisting as well. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Amy Degenhart from Degenhart Shared Architecture and Urban Design to take us through the Enviri Micro Urban Village. Welcome, Amy. Hi. Uh, um, thank you very much. It's uh, quite daunting being um, asked to do this presentation in such fantastic uh, company. Perhaps have I just started? <laughs> anyway, 
thank you very much for uh, the invitation to be here in such illustrious company. I'd like to tell you uh, a little bit about the, uh, it's actually the Envy micro urban village. And uh, uh, we, we picked that name deliberately because we're actually a little bit, the Gold Coast is a little bit envious of the, uh, the terrace housing that, that a lot of cities that we love around the world seem to have naturally. And we had to, to make a, a lot of effort to, to create ours. So um, that's where the, uh, the term comes from. Oh, now trying to make the next page. Mm. I can't seem to go forward. <laughs> oh no. There we go. I got it. Oh, good stuff. All right. So, um, Culture is the first um, thing we kind of thought about, and you know what uh, what is a backyard? Basically, the, the NV Micro Urban Village is a strategy to create a village out of a backyard or a single house lot. So um, you know, from Hills Hoist to Third Place, uh, Ubeity uh, sort of came into the um, the thinking process uh, because now homes are, are a lot more than than just their insides. It's where they're positioned. And how they extend into their environment and sort of use all of the resources around them. Um, particularly, we identified a lot of a lot of resources that were in, in um, inner um, urban areas that were available for some of this uh, alchemy to transition them from their former use to new uses. And some of those we uh, quite um, you know humorously referred to as trunk infrastructure. Uh, effectively, the the pipes and things under the ground, but also actually the street trees above the ground. Um, we're also trying to fight against something that uh, we often get um, overwhelmed with in housing these days, and that's actually the compound fracture. That's where all the housing is uh, um, circled into a compound with a nice big fence wrapped up, and you know, just doesn't interact with uh, with the city at all. In fact. The lovely examples of the laneways and arcades we've just seen just shows how that permeation through and connectivity is the joy of life. And so there's compound fractures that we'd like to call them the fighting against that joy. And then of course liquid assets, and that's uh, that's essentially um, you know the, the the land that's already there um, and and on the Gold Coast. <laughs> yes, of course the ocean and the, the beautiful uh, environment that we have to to um, to celebrate. Um, cracking the code was kind of our, that's what we had to do to create the Envy Micro Urban Village. We had to get in and between and around. We had to get the, the, the you know, the culmination for, for unlocking the, um, uh, all of those beautiful things that the city already has, but in a, in a residential, finely grained um, and uh, uh, freehold ownership manner way of, of doing that. This is one of our owners. He's actually jumping over his 4.5 meter lot because he was uh, a long jumper and uh, there's a theme in that and it's all about you know jumping into first owner ownership and and that kind of joy and also that um, step out into the unknown that that we you know we take and the owners that we brought along with us in the house land package model uh, they they really were jumping into the, the unknown as well but just because it hasn't been done before doesn't mean that it can't be done. And that's exactly what we believed. Uh, first there was the inspiration, ideation, execution, and now there's some extensions. But um, yeah, we, we had to basically jump into the unknown to, uh, to get it done. So this is the, ha this is the lot as it was when we uh, picked it. Uh, I collaborated with a town planner. The ideation came between the two of us. I was very experienced with small lot developments and, and she was very uh, experienced with, you know, manipulating uh, planning schemes and getting the best out of it. We decided that um, the, the priority development area of Southport was uh, uh, made this opportunity available where it wasn't normally as in there was no minimum lot size. Uh, we then scoured the area within the priority development area for a suitable uh, block of land. We came up with 12 and um, we saw if we, you know, we were able to select 
we preferred um, about three. That was one of them, and it was actually something that was able to be um, purchased. So um, the Enview Microurban Village subdivision started, uh, and this is how it is. Um, not actually today, because it's actually a bit greener, and I, I think one of the most beautiful things about um, this type of urban design is that everybody has got a garden to curate, and those gardens are actually pushed forward out onto the street rather than being back, um, set back, and uh, sort of in more private zones. We really believe that this type of development is um, it's actually greening the street. We had to do a lot of convincing to council that just because we didn't have a six meter setback or even sometimes a two meter setback, it didn't mean we had any less green. Um, part of that going vertically, but luckily from the ground so that it was sustainable and uh, part of it by just um, literally shoving it out as far as we could towards the edges and then also co-opting uh, uh, one of those natural resources, seeing the verges on the street, getting our street trees in there, which are already a bit bigger and uh, probably would have been oh, clever of me to, to get a more recent photo. Um, of course, I'm going to skip through this a bit. Uh, inspiration from the past, but um, you know, small lots, and, and that's the two of us, uh, Nicole, the town planner, and I. Uh, it's sort of in my grain is to look at um, the opportunities of how we can actually reshape suburbia, to be honest. Um, but what was kind of fun and surprising to us, because we actually had no idea about Nightingale when we started and we did our mission statement. And we found that this idea of consultant-led and particularly architect-led development was, um, it was, it was just one of those ideas that was in the air and so palatable well, that um, we needed, as architects, we needed to get back into a leadership uh, mode. And I, I think that um, Nightingale have done it so beautifully with, um, in Melbourne with, with a more vertical format. And our subdivision model is, is in fact a, a kind of a, a, a balance a balance in, a, in an, an ironic way that uh, we we're both thinking about at the same time. Some of our early designs um, and ideas and how is this really going to work and, and why is it going to be okay? Um, we broke almost every rule in the book when it comes to um, uh, subdivision and, and residential development. And one of those big rules that we broke was in fact, um, we created a house lot that had no provision for on-site car parking. Um, that was a, a, certainly a, a new idea and it was all about affordability because when you go to a cafe these days you can um, you know you can you can choose just to have a cup of coffee and you know you don't you don't have to have a meal uh, but when you're buying a house you seem to be forced to buy everything and everything actually at a certain size to be quite honest with codes um, you have to buy your car park you have to buy the um, land for it uh, and, and ultimately, it sort of forces you to buy that car because otherwise, what are you doing with all of that investment? So we know that, um, you know, we're looking at the edges of the bell curve and there's a lot of people that would, would love to choose a more sustainable lifestyle and move towards a car-free um, life, more healthy, walking, cycling, getting cars off the road. So big proposition uh, was uh, for affordability was not creating a driveway or an internal roadway system to service cars using what we had, limiting the development to what uh, was available, and that meant curating driveways and the verges very carefully, um, meaning we had four houses without any, any cars at all. Um, of course, proximity, location, we were in this golden triangle area of the PDA, Chinatown, we had the light rail, we've got the broad water, I mean, it's just a luscious, luscious location, an actual um, high rise site that yet surrounded um, uh, by, by still residential forms in two and three stories. So we fit in yet, you know, we fit in density wise, yet we fit in also um, building mass wise. Um, there you go, that's the existing site and the existing house. And then there, there we are after um, nine of the 10 approved um, houses have been constructed. And that little, and oh yes, I've got the little um, diagram there. That's the last lot there, uh, which is um, uh, unfortunately because of circumstances with COVID hasn't started construction yet, but it will very, very soon. And it will actually be, um, I guess we thought of it as our manor house or almost like our suburban house in the city 
whereas a lot of the other ones are just one and um, for one and two bedroom homes and that's all they would ever be um, as you can see only a few driveways we've got some of the homes without any car parking inside at all well this is where it started all the architects we love to see kind of those initial ideas uh, we were a little bit grander and I, I ideas on what might happen on the corner that ended up not being one house but three um, so we've got a few of the proportions wrong these are some of the photos inside I wish I had them um, sort of probably curated a few more of the lovely ones but this is um, the showing kind of using every single millimeter you know letting the light in through the top cantilevering the kitchen out over the stair it's a bit invisible you can't really see how that's done but it's it's tucked in there um, with a light wall coming through uh, sharing light to the entry um, the bath is under the stair as it winds around uh, this um, these winders here the bath is sort of under there so no space was left untouched and yet we've got more or less a flute design where it's light and windows open front and back cross ventilation and um, yeah, just celebrating the light. Um, and of course, it was all about the people. And so being um, as a freehold uh, subdivision, every one of these were homeowners and they curated their own home within the guidelines of the material change of use and under the um, uh, umbrella and, and with the helping hand of the architect. So it was a great way to introduce architecture to the lives of many people and young people particularly that would never um, probably seek the uh, services of an architect but because it was packaged with the land with with the building design and with the architect they were able to have that um, that pleasure of designing their own spaces and creating a territory uh, that was that was particular to them which is something probably rarer than um, I realized in uh, shopping for a house these days this was the um, conceptual rendering of what it was going to look like which is uh, you know with the trees a little bit taller but I must say it's not far from that we had to juggle a few of the buildings around um, in the final um, planning but we got very very close to the outcome and in fact you know the diversity oops oh yeah I wanted to go back <laughs> The diversity is even more. Oh no, where do you go back? I think I'm doing it. Okay, good. All right. I think we've actually created more diversity um, than than the rendering because of the influence of each of the individual owners, and we're very proud of that. And I think that's what uh, creates a bit of a, a, a traffic stopping moment at times. People really stop and look, and it's different. And I've worked out that it's two things that catches their eye. One is the transparency at the street. So people are really relating to the street because there's light, there's not a lot of barriers. And that's rare these days in urban areas when new developments create that openness and invite that interaction. Although it's layered and, and veiled, it is still there. Um, and also the diversity. So look, we're really pleased that it's um, seeded a few other like-minded ideas and, and developments. Uh, particularly the one right next to it to the north, which we were, we worked on with a client on the um, the same idea in terms of the um, of the town planning structure. But it's not a corner lot; it's actually um, an infill, um, an inner uh, block lot, which means a shorter frontage. And we're just amazed that we still got six freehold lots, two of them again without car parking on site. So a great affordability, and not only that, it continues a nice texture the street so maybe we're looking forward to having a whole street one day of this this type of diversity and housing and here's one of the um, first homeowners who's actually so thrilled she's got a studio space up here um, she came to me she said she was looking at a hundred places to buy before she was um, uh, sold on the idea because it wasn't the home all she could see was plans and um, you know, a couple of sketches and maybe a crude sort of video in terms of um, those types of presentations that architects do. And this is uh, how it turned out for her and um, a lot of it's her style, but it's just been wonderful. We've been lucky to be recognized for our efforts. We've, um, you know, we have shortlisted for the uh, Australian Urban Design Award. That was, uh, as far as we went on that one, we were um, 
even uh, like her to be recognised for the uh, efforts that this type of this style of project made uh, into affordability with the UDIA, a couple of uh, a finalist and a, and a winner there. And of course, um, as was mentioned earlier, the, the great stunner is um, being uh, recognised by your own um, community, architectural community, in the Regional Project of the Year, which we're absolutely thrilled about. And uh, we just love to share and, and love to elevate the, uh, the profession of architecture and hopefully get it out there, um, you know, rejuvenating our cities and, and, and as well as our suburbs. Thanks so much for your this opportunity and your attention. And thank you so much for that, Amy. Uh, last but not least, we will be handing over to um, Jesse Judd, who is the director of ARM, who will take us through the uh, on the journey across the hotter bridge, the hotter green bridge. I beg your pardon. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Julie. Um, hello from Melbourne, um, the other side of our border that's, uh, that's closed and making uh, delivering work up in Queensland a whole lot of fun. And I'm uh, speaking to you from one of our 90 branch offices at the moment, which is also a lot of fun. Um, the, this project is um, uh, some work that's been uh, delivered together with Archipelago, the, uh, the Hotter Green Bridge. Uh, and uh, a cast of um, many people have been involved in, in this project, ourselves, ARM, uh, Archipelago, um, uh, landscape architects uh, in Queensland and in Berlin, uh, a raft of engineers and a, and a raft of clients, uh, delivery agencies and, uh, and DNC contractors. Uh, and it's part of our project, um, the Gold Coast Cultural Precinct. Um, and uh, culture on the Gold Coast, everyone has a bit of a, bit of a chuckle at and say, what is that? Uh, and I'd argue that it's um, perhaps the most cultural place in Australia. Uh, it's, uh, it's Australia's um, only postmodern city or only real postmodern city. Uh, and it's always struggling to re reinvent itself, always thinking about its cultural definition. Uh, and this is um, one of those parts in, uh, uh, of that, which uh, a project that's been going for us for, for six years now. And um, in some respects, the culture of the Gold Coast is perhaps even diminishing. Um, so you can see it's kind of bold representation um, in its early um, presentation. And, and then some 30 years on, it's, um, it's dilution, um, which is kind of fascinating. And we're, we're, we're sort of trying to capture some of that uh, glory and, and, and that identity. Um, to, this, to the site particularly, uh, and the Evandale Peninsula, which sits out on the... Um, uh, suite of rivers and canals on the, the Rang River and uh, marking the transition of this site from a really an administrative parkland um, to, to it fulfilling its um, vision of a cultural precinct. Uh, and if we think about how to define the Gold Coast, and that's the task we've been we've been about for two years now, um, it's perhaps uh, to us defined by change and unpredictability. That's um, Amy's work just shows that too, um, how uh, unpredictable the, uh, the, the city is and, and how wonderful that situation is. So we're searching for this sort of DNA that will help us continue to master plan um, the project over the, um, over the years and struck ac across this um, Voronoi um, geometry, um, which is inherent in so many different things in nature. And one of the beautiful things about the Voronoi is how it sort of self-generates. So every time we, um, we do something, it, it kind of heals itself or, or, or start something new, which is rather beautiful for a multi-stage project. Um, so rather than some sort of classic symmetry and master planning where we're searching for axes or, or order or some beautifully artful curve, we're after some kind of self-generating geometry um, that's rather chaotic but has moments of intensity. So this is our, um, a view from our um, 2014 competition entry uh, for the project, uh, and that we knew at that point that the, um, like this is a council funded project with no state government input, uh, and it would need to be delivered in small bites that a local government can deal with. Um, so we proposed 19 different phases, of which we've been lucky enough to, to deliver um, three so far, and we're, we're still at it, and some of those, um, those snapshots um, from the competition. Um, and 
we conceived of it as a sort of series of moments or postcards that would generate um, and, and deliver the cultural precinct as culture continues to, to define itself, I guess, on the coast. Um, so some of you have seen uh, last year's uh, entrant in this awards program and, and, and winner, uh, and the first stage, which was the, um, the amphitheatre. Uh, and, uh, and that's here's some of the work um, that we've done um, progressively over the five years. And the amphitheatre, as it was in very early days, and then developed into um, you know, the place that it is now, uh, which is uh, sort of a wonderful outdoor auditorium with, um, with the beautiful Southeast Queensland um, uh, cross section of nature growing over the, the, top, of the top of it and, uh, and nature's beautiful amp amphitheatre or auditorium um, capable of, of six or seven thousand people uh, in celebration mode. Um, but to this project, uh, the Green Bridge, uh, the task was to span across the Narang um, some 130 um, metres across a reasonably sh shallow and, uh, and floodplain uh, river, and also quite a low bridge, the same height as, as an adjacent bridge. Uh, and some of the urban morphology of um, the Gold Coast is connecting into Elkhorn Avenue, which is, um, which is just north of uh, Carroll Avenue. Uh, and the yellow line represents the path that one used to have to take if you're on foot or on bicycle to get to our site. And um, in many respects, just a very short bridge halves the length of, of journey to the cultural precinct from surface. And also means you don't have to go through quite a awful trunk road experience in Ferry Road or um, on Bundle Road uh, and gets you to a very pleasant uh, path through there. Uh, and also hopefully activating Chevron Island, which is a, it's a beautiful uh, part of the world in and of itself. Um, now this little peninsula here, um, hasn't always been sort of isolated. Uh, it used to be part of a singular landmass, and that's quite a fascinating little land bridge um, that occurred in, uh, in the uh, in the 50s. Uh, and then uh, Myers Ferry uh, also sort of took off from that point. So as soon as the um, uh, the land bridge was severed, or, or uh, a ferry used to pass um, a similar pathway. Uh, and some of the work that the council did early days to determine together with the with the community where it should go uh, and one of those unique scenarios that is so very much Gold Coast is urban infrastructure landing directly people's backyards and how that might play out is a really interesting thing. Um, to our competition entry which conceived of uh, the bridge is quite a complex um, scenario uh, and some of those um, views. Uh, and some of the interactions with the with the lake that we'd sort of promised as part of our competition entry too. Uh, the peninsula has a beautiful uh, lake, Evandale Lake, which people do 150 metre long lap swims in, and it's one of the nicest spots to do lap swimming in, in the Goldie. Um, so we promised all sorts of amazing interventions in the lake, and we're very proud that the, the bridge is starting to deliver on some of those um, experiences. Uh, as we got a bit closer to delivering this phase of the project, uh, it was decided by uh, the, the burghers of the Gold Coast to take this out to a DNC um, procurement process, which is often the fear of all architects. So we prepared um, a, a reference design in, in many respects, which started to look like uh, this, uh, and uh, had, had to be, um, the competition entry and started to build on some of those Voronoi geometries that I showed you earlier. Uh, and some of those exploratory studies to, to develop up the reference design. We also um, worked up a kit of parts too that uh, were part of that reference design, including a balustrade uh, and some studies here for um, other infrastructure elements. These are some of the piers that sit in, in the water. Uh, and then as it came uh, to a tender process, um, a far more refined version of the same and you can see that instead of interacting with the river as significantly, we're now playing in the, uh, on the edge of the lake uh, and, and, and in that structure. Some of those views um, looking back from Shepherd Island towards, um, towards Evandale Parklands. And some of those uh, um, views that were part of the tender process. Uh, and this is the, the a rather blue looking river and, uh, and the Evandale Lake. Uh, one of the beautiful things that uh, was brought by the DNC tenderer who worked together with um, with Archipelago uh, was um, the bringing in artwork as part of the project. So um, 
how architecture sort of melded into urban design, melded into public art. And here, Warren Langley and Jess Austin uh, came up with this um, lovely sculpture, 40 Million Mornings, sort of marking uh, you know, the, the beautiful sky that is the Gold Coast and how that might relate to a sort of timeless quality of, a, of um, Indigenous occupation for that long. And some of those conceptual propositions that came with that, uh, that artwork proposition, as well as some of the, the sort of the high tech bits and pieces too here, some of those grasshopper scripting. Uh, which developed up uh, with Archipelago and, and ourselves to, to generate this wonderful sort of sculptural balustrade or prow that, uh, that, prompt, that poked into the, uh, the Evandale Lake. Um, and then snipping, uh, snipping fast forward into some of the process, some of the prototyping for those, that artwork uh, here in the fabricate, Fabricators Workshop uh, in, in Southern Queensland. Uh, and then uh, that, that uh, prototype out on site, um, complete with lighting tests. So we're very much advocates of one-to-one -one scale testing of our, of our projects if we can, uh, and to just make sure, it's the only way to make sure that it's gonna deliver what you promise. And that um, carried through to um, elements such as balustrading and, uh, and platforming and hand railing and all of those bits and pieces. But if you get right in the smallest prototype, um, you could then easily replicate with, um, with confidence, uh, including um, elements such as refining this um, mesh screening to test for, for strength and also um, screening for overlooking as we, as we um, cross past the, um, the residence's backyard. Uh, and then the rather epic um, construction method, which involves cranes on barges and lifting um, huge bits of infrastructure uh, into play. Um, and here, here's the, one of the major spans of the bridge, rather excitingly being barged down the river and being plonked onto, um, onto its pylons, um, which is kind of the epic level. But it also shows in that first instance how, how important bridging that link is, connecting the two sides and then the pedestrians and, and cyclists um, firstly interacting with that beautiful water body of the, the Evandale Lake uh, and uh, showing some of those constructions. And I guess some of that landscape um, reinforcement or replacement, both in River's Edge and in, and in Lake Edge uh, there. Uh, and then the, the beautiful moment, um, any projects um, uh, got many authors and these are the, the 12 burgers of, uh, of the Gold Coast, some of the authors of the project, of course. Um, cutting the ribbon, uh, and then people on opening day enjoying uh, swimming in the lake uh, with the now um, quite structural backdrop of, of, the, uh, of the pedestrian bridge. Uh, and then all sorts of other people um, enjoying um, that experience at a range of scales through here. And we quite liked that the so-called green bridge wasn't green at all, but rather, rather a, a dramatic blue. Uh, at night, um, a, a very identifiable um, piece of work in and of itself and, and rather um, destinational. Um, our friend uh, Rob Luxford took this video, which shows um, about a 10 minute walk, and I hope it's streaming somewhat, um, and how one might get from the, the city um, quite comfortably through to the cultural precinct uh, in, a, in, a, um, in a new way, in a fantastically new way. Uh, and how that experience of walking underneath the uh, around the river and back around to the uh, uh, to the uh, sculptural bridge is going to keep playing forever. It looks like. Um, so if you um, if we zip forward um, to um, to what's next, just for a bit of fun to cap things off, uh, we're now at stage uh, three of our of the project which is well under construction, which is the, um, the Hotter Gallery. And I, I keep putting up um, posts from the Gold Coast Bulletin because it's one of my favourite newspapers. Um, and uh, this gallery is, uh, is under construction now. It's inspired by this beautiful painting um, by William Robertson. Uh, and it's gonna be uh, Australia's largest regional gallery um, with seven stories uh, of, uh, of different gallery experiences, including a huge, um, uh, uh, large format exhibition gallery on the ground floor, uh, vertical galleries of 300 square metres stacked one on top of the, the other. This is a large format gallery. We're not promising this um, rather fabulous artwork. Um, and then some views of it.
at night and uh, how it how it appeared um, as of last week. And um, being um, being out of town and not able to visit site while that built is being built is um, rather a lot of fun. Um, but we've been getting by with these interactive three D videos, watching every little bolt um, go up online. So um, the job continues even though. Uh, we're in ISO and, and behind the locked borders. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for that, uh, Jesse. You actually did take us across the bridge. That was, we did journey across the bridge with you. That was great. Yeah. Um, I'd like to thank uh, all of our presenters today. I really do uh, appreciate your professional generosity and um, good luck to you all when the State Awards stream on uh, Thursday the 9th of July at 7 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. Um, for everybody who joined us as an audience or attendee today, um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and stay safe. Thanks. Thank you.